So great to have you, Armin, if you could introduce yourselves a little bit for our audience. Yeah, hello, I'm Armin Baumschlager. I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Um, I'm generally interested in, in implementing control in biology, bringing control to a new level in biology, especially through methods like optogenetics through light control. Right. Thanks for, for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, I had a few few mishaps in, in scheduling and that sort of thing, but we've made it in the end. Um, I invited you today. I read one of your reviews on uh, engineering light control in biology. And I thought it was really interesting. So I was hoping you could share a little bit more about that with us and for our audience. So if you would, could you start off by perhaps introducing what are what is optogenetics? So yeah, the, the word optogenetics is kind of a, a Franken word for, for methods that use optical technology. So light in a broad spectrum and genetics, genetically encoded elements, usually proteins. And the goal of optogenetics um, is to control a biological function with light. This can be enzyme, enzyme catalysis, but it can also be the binding of an antibody to its target and so on. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know how you see it, but using light to control biology might sound a little bit futuristic, but if you, if you think about it, um, it's actually quite a fundamental natural signal. So for example, if we place a plant close to a window, we see how it will direct its leaves towards the window and eventually also grow in this direction. Um, it grows to the light to capture more light for photosynthesis. Um, and also we as animals, we react to light through the sense of sight, which gives us information about our surroundings. And it can trigger so-called circadian rhythms, which make us sleepy when it gets dark or awake when, when it's sunny, at least when it's not super hot, right? like right now. Um, so sensing and reacting to light is, is usually very natural, I would say, in biology. Mm. Um, but yeah, if you want, I can talk a little bit about also the history of optogenetics. Sure. Yeah, that would um, be good. So, so as far as I know, um, at least the word optogenetics first appeared um, in, in a publication in 2006 in the context of neurobiology. At that time, researchers um, started using light-gated ion channels from algae for, for neuronal research. And they used this light-gated ion channels which localize in the membrane of cells um, and can then pump ions into the cell or outside of it. Um, the clue is that this iron pumping function can be turned on and off depending um, if the protein sees light or not, so to say. And of course, neuroscientists, neuro neuroscientists got very excited about this because um, the cool thing is that it was suddenly possible to activate neurons in brains. Um, and all of that in, in living animals. It's pretty incredible if you think about it. Um, yeah, and I don't know, you, you might have seen these pictures and videos of mice with an optic fiber going into their brain. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, through, through this fiber and this um, optogenetic ion channel, it was possible for the researchers to influence the behavior or even, even the emo emotions in mice. And yeah, I think that attracted a lot of, of attention in, in the science community, but also in, in the public, which is quite understandable, I would say. Um, but yeah, so this is how it started, but optogenetics is, is really not limited to neurobiology or, or iron channels. And in fact, many other biological functions um, were synthetically made light, light controllable in the last, let's say 10 to 20 years because um, yeah, being able to turn a protein on and off practically at will um, and, and with precise targeting. So for example, you can target with light individual cells. Um, it can be very attractive to, to many different applications. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's kind of the, the whole picture. Yeah, yeah, that was a great introduction. Thank you. What are, what are some of the ways at a sort of protein mechanistic level how biology uses light to control um, reactions and those sorts of things. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so generally um, light sensitive proteins, uh, be it in nature or, or synthetic uh, proteins, always or usually consist of, of a light sensitive domain and an effector protein domain. Um, the light sensitive domain um, usually contains a, a bound chemical, a so-called chromophore, um, which absorbs the light. Right. This then leads to, to a change in the conformation of the chromophore or its interaction with the protein domain um, so that the light sensitive protein um, would not work without the, this light absorbing chromophore structure. Mm. Um, and this is important to know, especially um, when you want to use light sensitive proteins in, in non-native host before the, because the, the chromophore needs to be available in those cells. Right. So, um, yeah, for, for, for some chromophores, this is not an issue because they are present in basically all cells, such as aromatic amino acids as part of proteins or metabolites such as flavins, um, which in general in cells are, are uh, important for redox reactions. But in other um, cases, these chromophores, these light absorbing moieties can be quite complex. And um, the more complex structures uh, uh, usually absorb higher wavelength of light in the green to red light spectrum. And these special chromophores are not present in, in, in all different species. So uh, for example, some algae have light sensitive proteins that contain very specific chromophores um, that are not present in, in E. coli and mammalian cells. And so when you want to use this, um, you will also have to add the chromophore to the medium or, or the metabolic right. pathway. Okay, so is most of, most or all of these proteins have this chromophore, is, or is there, are there other mechanisms yeah. by which light control can occur? So um, if we talk about optogenetics, so with genetic elements, um, it usually requires um, such a chromophore or at least aromatic amino acids to absorb the light. Right. Um, of course, there, there are also other ways um, of achieving light control in biology, um, such as with light sensitive chemicals. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, those are more than chemo optogenetic methods uh, and not really optogenetic methods where you have everything encoded. Um, in a genetic setup. So, um, how will uh, scientists go around uh, to engineer uh, this light controlled uh, systems uh, in organisms? And maybe can you tell us a bit more about uh, your research in this area? Yeah, um, so let's say if you want to make a certain function um, light controllable in your organism of interest, um, and no other researcher has yet developed an optoprotein that does what you want. Um, so let's say you want uh, light regulation of gene expression. Um, a quite obvious way for synthetic biologists would be to search um, some protein or genomic databases, do some literature research and, and find a light sensitive protein in, in nature that does what you want. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, for your light-induced um, gene expression, um, you find a, a light-inducible transcription factor in the genome of some plant. Um, then you would simply take the sequence of this gene and then try to transfer it to your organism of interest. Um, you then need to see if, if the protein is still functional in your organism of interest. And if it is, then you can optimize its function. Um, unless you're super lucky and everything works like a charm first try. <laughs> um, yeah, and this can be through optimization of, of, of the, for example, the concentration in the cell. Um, yeah, of course, for this strategy, a native light sensitive protein with the desired function must exist um, and also already be described. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to find it. Um, and if that's not the case, um, so no native protein exists, then an optoprotein needs to be engineered. How to do this best really depends on the protein that shall be made light sensitive. Um, so for example, let's say that the template protein has a, a sensory and an effector domain um, where the sensory domain reacts to chemicals or hormones in your cell. 
um, and you now want to, to um, change the factor domain to become light controllable. In that case, um, you can use a, a technique called domain swapping, um, yeah, where you basically just swap out the chemical sensing domain with the, the, uh, in the protein of interest and replace it with a light sensing one and hope that this still works. Yeah, in the case of an enzyme where, where this is not possible um, because it's, natu it, it's naturally doesn't contain any sensing domains, um, a smart way could be to split the enzyme into two non-functional parts and then fuse light sensitive binding domains to each of these split parts. Um, these light sensitive binding domains usually do not interact in the dark or, or rarely interact in, in dark conditions, but bind to each other when you induce it with light. And this can then be used to reconstitute the function of the enzyme um, uh, from the negative split parts. And, and this is also uh, where I did, did some of my research on. Um, yeah, so, so in the end, if you want to make a, a protein light inducible, as most things in, in biology, it's always up to context, um, what approach might be most suited. Okay. What, in your opinion, what are some sort of exciting successes in, in the field where people have been able to engineer proteins that were not light sensitive and they engineer them to be light sensitive? Uh, light sensitive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that the first, um, transcription system in yeast, which uh, actually appeared, uh, I think be even before the discovery of, of the light gated ion channels in, in neurobiology, I think that was a, a really big step because it, it, it was actually based on, on a, a yeast to hybrid system where you have a, a DNA binding domain and an activation domain. Um, and usually it's, it's used to study protein protein interaction. Um, so the, the DNA binding domain is fused to one protein and the activation domain is fused to another protein. And if those two proteins interact, then you get um, transcription from, for example, a reporter gene. And um, yeah, in this first study, uh, what they did is kind of a, a continuation of this yeast to hybrid system where they replaced those, those protein domains, uh, yeah, those interaction domains with light sensitive ones. And that really then allowed to, to control gene expression with light. And yeah, starting from there, there were many, um, many nice steps. So where, for example, when, when people started to actually use this concept and uh, um, to apply feedback control, because um, one of the main advantages of, of using light inputs is that you can um, apply the light, you can um, turn the switch off again, um, and yeah, you can use this to, to um, start to yeah, create more interesting studies in biology, let's say, to investigate, for example, gene functions or to optimize certain processes to certain levels. Nice. Yeah. Do, is there any thing, other things you can think of where it's more, um, I guess, like a single pathway being activated that almost like an expression of something, an expression of a protein in response to light that you, anything like that? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? So if there are any sort of, so that's sort of like a assay based application, I guess, would you say, where it's like you're testing two, two proteins coming together and, um, and then you can sort of detect them. Is there any, or do you know of any, uh, applications of this where you are engineering say a pathway in a cell to be activated in sort of a metabolic engineering sort of uh, sense where you might want to create cells that do something in response to light. Uh, yes, of course. Um, yeah, so, so there were recently a couple of studies uh, from Princeton University on, on this, but also from, from other places um, which um, yeah, tried to do exactly this. So optimize a, a metabolic pathway um, and, and use the features of light um, to, to, uh, to get even better yields than what you can get with for a static induction of, for example, gene expression mm -hmm. or, or of a metabolic pathway. 
And um, yeah, if you think further that there, there are many possibilities that, that this brings that you can um, add and remove the input. So, so uh, for example, if you imagine that a metabolic pathway creates a toxic intermediate, um, if you have kind of a sensor for this toxic intermediate, you can adjust your, yeah. your um, expression level based on this and um, yeah, create better, better metabolic flows. And also, if you think of, of upscaling in, in, in biotechnological applications, so you usually start from, you know, the small um, microliter, milliliter cultures, and then you go into bigger and bigger reactors and all of the conditions, yeah, or, or a lot of the conditions change. And um, yeah, it gives you kind of this knob to also change then your, your input and your expression level depending on what you see in, in those bioreactors and in, in those cultures when you do the upscaling, um, just as an example. Mm, yeah. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, does, uh, how, what are the, like, the advantages of uh, using optogenic uh, inducers of gene expression compared to like chemical uh inducers like um i i heard uh, i was uh, i read that um for instance there were there was more control of the spatial temporal uh, uh expression of genes uh i don't know could you ex uh, explain more um about that mm -hmm. sure yeah so um definitely that that is i think one of the main features that the spatial temporal control that you have so um, with temporal control, mean, we mean that you can switch the light on and off. And so you switch the, the gene expression on and off. And you can do this repeatedly. And it, it's, not, um, it's, it's usually very easy because, I mean, you, you can just program your, your light input that you want. Um, whereas if you have chemicals, once you add your chemical to the culture, it's quite difficult to remove it again. So, I mean, of course you can filter your culture and try to get rid of the media, but um, yeah, it's, it's not really that feasible, especially if you think of high throughput or, or bigger culture volumes. Um, and so, and also that the, the temporal resolution that you have, um, basically in, in, for, for a light input, you can switch the, the, the light input in, in seconds, milliseconds, even if you want. Um, whereas if you do those kind of filter-based methods, um, it's much slower. So um, yeah, that is definitely an, a big advantage of optogenetics. The other one that you already mentioned is this, this spatial control that you have. So with optogenetics, if you think about it in, in a microscopic setting, you can apply different patterns or you can activate individual cells within a population. And you can study how this activation of your of, of the, the function or the gene of interest that you start expressing is affecting the rest of the population, just mm -hmm. um, as one of those examples. Um, yeah, so, so there, there are many um, advantages that it brings. Um, some people also say that it's cheaper <laughs> because yeah. in, inducer chemicals, especially in, 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 yeah, in, in bulk uh, gene expression um, can be expensive, whereas light, you, you only need to pay the electricity bill in the end. What might be this, I guess it sounds kind of easy to be sort of doing domain swapping and these sorts of things. What are the challenges that you uh, encounter when you're actually trying to engineer these light controlled proteins? Mm -hmm. So more generally for, for uh, speaking, there are, I think, both biological and technical challenges if, if you want to start uh, implementing light control in your biological research. So on the biological levels, first of all, um, the, the field of optogenetics is not that old yet. So um, it might be that, that for the, the function you're interested in, there is no optoprotein yet. Um, and the engineering process can be quite laborious and, mm. and a, a whole project on its own with yeah, a, a rather uncertain success rate. Right. And um, part of my research interest is actually to find ways to, to reduce this barrier. 
But uh, in general, if, if you don't uh, have an uh, optoprotein, but still want to implement optogenetics in your research, um, in such cases, um, you, you can always go back to those, to those light inducible gene expression systems. Um, because there you can basically put the, the, the gene of the gene of interest or, or the gene that produces the, the biological function that you want under light control. And um, you can still have many of those features and many of those spatial temporal features. Um, slight drawback here is that you compromise on the on off dynamics um, of your function of interest because you need to wait for, for transcription and translation to occur before your, your protein of interest is there. And when you switch off the light, you need to wait for degradation or dilution of that gene. Um, but yeah, these dynamics might be good enough for, for your application. Mm -hmm. And on, on the technical side, um, yeah, one challenge might be that, that not many labs really use light regulation yet. Right. So if you start, you might have to set up uh, your light induction devices before you can do any experiments. But yeah, on the bright side, there are already a number of DIY designs um, available now, um, which use very simple electronic components and LEDs. Um, and that makes setting up your, your light induction um, devices easier. And yeah, a, a more general technical challenge is that if you have large volumes of cells, be it in, in a large bioreactor or, or in a synthetic organ, it can be quite difficult to, to reach the cells in the middle of your, of your culture. Um, and, and you only basically get the, 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 the cells on the outside because they absorb the light and, and mm. inside it's always dark. I mean, in, in steered systems, such as in a bioreactor, it's, it's usually less problematic, um, but one might need to, to tune the on-off kinetics of those optoproteins uh, opto opto um, appropriately. And that by itself can be challenging. Mm. And um, yeah, in more static systems, such as in synthetic organs, you, you um, can't simply mix the cells. Um, and so things get a little bit more complicated. Um, what one can do is um, to consider doing light induction with more long wave thread light, which penetrates tissues um, better than, for example, let's say short wavelength blue light. Right. Yeah, but in general, um, I would say if you if you think that light, light regulation can be an advantage for your experiments, um, then I would always definitely say give it a try, because yeah. I, I still think it's it's magical to to simply shine light on your cells and then um, they change the behavior and sometimes even do what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so cool. You mentioned that the engineering can still be quite long and you know perhaps it's a full project on its own but are there and you said that your research is sort of in the area of reducing that the time that it might take to engineer um how yeah how how is that effort going i guess yeah so um i mean i, I think it's not just my effort, but it's it's more a general effort of the whole field to to find more generalizable principles and approaches um, to uh, to yeah define how to to optimize tools um, yeah so so it, it's um, yeah the it's a basic synthetic biology approach I would say right yeah so sort of just characterizing standardizing things and that sort of thing. So they're easier to use next time you want to design. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, I just, uh, yeah, I have a question uh, regarding, uh, so you mentioned that uh, one of the challenges for, uh, because it's a nascent field, uh, one of the challenges uh, is, um, is a technical, in the technical details, is that labs have to shift uh, around their, uh, uh, the light systems to be able to work with optogenics or something. Um, so what could those like, uh, like light, light tools be, for instance? Um, so, so the light sources that you can use in, in the lab or? 
So you like just the line, the lining uh, and the love basically. So they have to be shifted to be work to be able to like work or like is there like any specifics uh, like like a machine that uh, loves my need uh, to to be able to work with optogenics? Ah, yeah. So um, not really any special machines. Right. You, you can You just need some kind of light sources. Um, so this can be as simple as LEDs. So mm -hmm. some that you can buy for a couple of uh, of cents um, everywhere in, in electronic shops. Um, then you also need some some um, technical equipment to to control those LEDs. You can do this with very simple um, devices such as with Arduinos, um, where you can that you can actually program um, what kind of um, um, yeah what kind of light pattern you want to apply. And um, yeah, so so I think. Um, the, just to get the basic setup running, um, the, the hurdle is pretty low, I would say. Also yeah. financially pretty low and technically pretty low. Mm -hmm. um, to create like really good um, reproducible um, but, uh, yeah, experiments, um, there of course you, you need to um, find ways for your devices to be really re reproducible and to have a reproducible setup. Yeah. Um, and for this, um, there are some um, some some setups that that uh, have been published for do-it-yourself devices, for for example um, plate-based assays where you have an either 24 volt plates or 96 volt plates where you can do your experiments in, where you 3D print your basic chassis, and then you have some electronic components um, that you that you assemble. And um, that is usually also in, in the low hundreds um, euros or pounds. Okay. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, curious that, I mean, work, working with uh, optogenics seems to be like the um, intersection between the, like uh, electronics and biology. And um, I'm just uh, wondering, is it like, uh, is it like easy to like, uh, apply both uh, like apply uh, the electronics uh, for like uh, I don't know like biological like uh, applications or I don't know because it seems to be like quite a nascent thing thing yes it is um, but um, yeah if you if you really see a need for for um, dynamic regulation especially, uh, in your experiments, then I, I think it's definitely worth um, to put in the effort. Um, yeah, for for spatial regulation, the setups that are needed are, are yeah I would say a little bit more sophisticated. So what 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 researchers have used are are for example microscopic settings, um, which are then even further equipped with with um, so-called DMDs, digital mirror devices. So kind of you can imagine it like a projector going through your microscope and then projecting some kind of image on your cells. Um, and this then allows you to, to target individual cells or, or, or create kind of pattern. So doing that in, in, uh, with low cost tech, I, I see a bit of a challenge. Um, yeah, but for, for temporal control, I, I think this is, this is definitely easily feasible. Mm 